these two early walks on Saturday and Sunday in September are for me meditations. I'm not actually out here to lecture anybody, I'm out here to see. Look at that. The light. Slowly coming. I've got privilege to see it in reflections. It's a bit like purgatory. I'm stuck down here with no key. The door, the door back to my apartment is locked. Everybody's asleep up there, so I can't get out of the basement of this resorty type place that I'm in. So I'm here with no key. Now, this is quite providential because this morning I woke up with a big story sort of being preached at me to me or insight that I felt very true relating to Martin Luther I even wrote a song he wrote the writer who wrote it the words the lyrics I'll try and sing it later the lyrics are as soon as a coin in the coffers rings a soul from purgatory springs but once you're down in the basement or in purgatory, locked away, you haven't got a key, you haven't got a coin, you can't put it in the coffers yourself. Somebody's got to do it for you. So the priests used to sell these indulgences. That means that you'd stand around the street or the market or near the temple or wherever, and you'd say that song, hey, your grandmother, your grandfather, your ancestors are all dead. They broke the law, or they weren't in the church and there's no salvation outside the church. <laughs> but I have good news for you. As soon as a coin in the coffers rings, their soul from Beritoe springs today. And then again tomorrow. Next day after all. There is no salvation outside the church. Not much has changed in all these years. So, I found some people who are young and alive and going to ride a bike and they've got a key. They're going to put the key in the hole here for me and get me out of purgatory. So this nice lady let me out. Nice people. So here I am on the beach and I have a nice sky to look at, very calm waters, it's not beautiful, I have been sprung. Another set of images came to me while I was in my semi-somniatic state this morning, waking up from strange dreams. And one of them was the words that often come to me when I look at the heavens and the stars and the moon and the stars or whatever it is that have been made. I consider what is humanity that we think God considers us and there are two ways to look at that one is you could say when I look at the moon and the stars and the things you have made O Lord what is man compared to all of that what is man and that's a great theme for the atheists but an old fellow who's now long gone passed on <clears throat> said no that it doesn't mean that, it doesn't mean what is man, it means wow. Look at the magnificence of all of that. 
Hmm. There's a moon somewhere up there behind me today. Wow. How significant I must be if God considers me. And I'm loved. And I'm not loved by a lawgiver. I'm loved by the life giver. That's a father. compassionate, the most merciful, and then we start off with saying Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, and that means all praise be to God, Lord of the worlds, and then in Arabic Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, which is the most compassionate, the most merciful, and then Malik al is the master of the day of judgment. What was significant about the discussion was that it came in the context of my considerations of the fatherhood of God, and I'm happy for that to be a metaphor because our fatherhood is quite deficient in terms of its mercy and grace and love, words which are quite deficient in terms of defining the love of God, but they'll do for our circumstances. So my considerations were about the fatherhood of God. What's happened in the last few weeks is more clarity about the relationship between what Protestants call, or Christianity maybe calls, common grace and special grace. In our system, common grace, in our church systems, I should say, common grace has tended to take an inferior seat to uh, special grace. So we keep bashing the promoting the idea of getting saved from our sins and then we have all this blood and sacrifice still continuing into the 21st century when in fact the whole purpose of what Jesus was doing was to bring us back to the Father the Father of Providence so that all of this out here has to do with the love of God I have some friends who are very concerned about culture. The fact that Christianity does not seem to be able to get involved in culture unless it's to get them saved into the church outside of which there is no salvation. The kingdom of God is not a ghetto. The love of the Father is poured out in the good and the bad alike. That's good and bad in religious terms. God is Father, gracious, loving. St John, almost the penultimate apostle in terms of time, says God is love. This is the message. We realise that the kingdom of God is not in the little ghetto of the church that's selling forgiveness yeah. one way or another. Yeah, yeah. So it's, I can't remember the context of the conversation, like well the actual conversation, but it was all about sort of Jesus and I guess, I guess, and of course, the focus was on him. But he, oh, what did he say? But, but the, yeah, the point was, which sort of stopped everybody. And it, why? he said, "Why are we so focused on Jesus when Jesus clearly said, i 'I've come to point the way to my Father.'" Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And because he, he was and saying, that's talking why about we the are Father Christians, and Kingdom. Not because yeah. We're not denying the divinity of Christ. Yeah, yeah, Because he yeah. does nothing but what the Father does. Yes. In, in him, all the essence of the Father dwells in bodily form but it's the father that he testifies yeah, yes, to yes. and he doesn't want it any other way yes and all it was like but why are we not focused on who jesus says he's come to point to to show exactly. us yeah. so the reason is because of the, the power thing yeah yeah but also because if you yeah. think the bible is the word of god rather than he being the word yes, of god yeah, and i'm saying there's a contra i'm not saying there's a contradiction yeah, yeah. There. But the Bible also says about Jesus and also says about the Father. Yes. If you don't get that in the right yeah. sort of theoretical yeah. order, you will always stuff it up one way or another yes. for people. So what we end up doing is we subject the Father to the Son in the wrong way. Yeah. We subject the Son to Judaism yes. in the wrong way. Yes. We subject Ju Judaism 
to is subject to Jehovah, the, the lawgiver, yeah. instead of the love of the Father, mm. you trade in the indulgences of guilt. Yeah. You can sell forgiveness in religion. Mm, gosh. And that's all that's yeah. that you see yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. bit earlier today my eyes were quite sore when I woke up for a visit to the loo so I've been up for an hour looking for things to make my eyes work woke my daughter woke my family up eyes the eyes are pretty important and light is Right on. Again, that's what was on my mind, so I'm walking down the same street again. About an hour earlier, darker. The birds are singing. And this morning's theme when I woke, among others, was light, knowing, ways of knowing. I think mainly light and if light darkness and stillness yes yeah, stillness was there and stillness eyes and light pretty important combination for me because when I think of stillness you still know that I am God comes to mind that beautiful old hymn and uh, very much true for me, precondition of the kind of knowing that I prefer to know is stillness, and I mean stillness of mind. Japanese Zen people, they teach not just the fact of objects out there, like a tree and that post and that wire and that sign over there which you can barely see in the middle of the screen but they teach about objects in the mind and that's important to me because objects in the mind are otherwise known as thoughts Indians talk of that too thoughts in the mind and in our traditions Christian traditions and theology and so on, we do have lots of thoughts and those Easterners speak of those thoughts as objects in your mind. I have a Thai daughter-in-law and she cooks with lots of spices, sometimes sits on the floor, floor and pommels spices in a big heavy bowl. A couple of weeks ago, about 10 days ago, I was standing with my little granddaughter making jelly and the big pommeling thing, I forget what you call it now, fell off the sink straight onto my second toe on the left foot. Objects like that, very hard. But what we don't realise is that objects in the mind, thoughts in the mind are very hard too. We have this theory in the West that knowledge and enlightenment have something to do with each other. But in the East, knowledge originating and focusing and being expressed from the intellect is the creator of hard objects of the mind upon which we stumble. And they cannot be called light. The hard objects of the mind while we say the parts of intellect actually cause us not to see. And that's a tough thing to say when you, you're a professional philosopher, theologian or theorist. Good morning. So light eyes, mind thoughts, 
all this kind of thing, they're all part of the existence of a human being. And they're all important, but they need to be ordered by something, a principle of spirit, a principle of insight that is deeper than objects of thought. So it became very clear to me over the years that while thought and insight of the mind appear to enlighten us, what happens in fact is that thoughts narrow the whole of reality down to thought, small areas of life that we give name to and meaning to, respective to our cultures and our climates, our geography, our traditions, our schooling, our whims and our desires and our corruptions. But we do not only in universities and theological colleges and in religion and in all the academic disciplines of the universities and so on, we do put our hope in those tiny little areas that we have named and given our meaning to. It's, it's quite demonstrable, you know, if you think about the different cultures in the world, everybody's reacted to their environment, their backgrounds, their traditions, the authorities in their lives, such that they have come up with different gods, different uses, different architecture, different kinds of family relationships or non-family relationships. The cultures of the world are fascinating, but to turn any one of them, including my religious culture or your religious culture, into the ideal, into the sacred, in the sense of the absolute, and then to try and get other people to follow it, it's, it appears to have some value, but, you know, even the physicists say we, we really think we only know about 4% what we really could know about the physical universe. How much less do we know? And how much less can we con confidently articulate such that we would impose it on people, the knowledge of God as an object? But that's what we do. I have a friend in a particular congregational situation. One of the words he uses a lot is disfellowship. Otherwise we cast them out of the church or defrock or we do all kinds of things because people disagree about mental objects. Well, I just want to say that those mental objects are not what the Bible talks about, what Jesus talks about, what the Buddhists talk about, nor the Indians talk about as light. Words are not light. Words and thoughts must respond to a deeper intuition. Jesus called it the Spirit of God. When this Spirit was to come upon his disciples, he would guide them into all truth and that truth would have a basis to it that's something deeper than knowing in the intellect. The intellect responds to this truth. And when you have people like the atheists, the, the, the four horsemen, Richard Dawkins type, and those people that want to eliminate God, very often I find that they're not really eliminating God, but they are highlighting their own mental objects as better than our mental objects, that is, the mental objects of people of religion and faith. Insight that is at the depth of real assurance, and it's very hard for people to be honest about that. The difference between mental objects and the assurance that is required, or that is available, when we do something like what St John of God promoted, when we work from the perspective of unknowing rather than knowing. I'm pretty much there, pretty happy to say unknowing, then to come to stillness, to allow the mental objects to float around of course and be there, but to respond to them from something deeper than the objects themselves. And that's where assurance comes from.
doesn't evolve. Human thought evolves and responses are relative. Responses to the knowledge or the idea or even the objection to God. All of those things evolve, but God doesn't evolve. That speaks to our ignorance, not to our knowledge. Every denomination that I've had to do with in terms of religion, philosophy or whatever, or most anyway, want to turn God into a solid block of knowledge, largely for their security, but also for their purity. Exclusive in, exclusivism comes in. And if you don't believe according to this block of knowledge and act according to these statutes and laws and ethical expectations, then you don't know God, which is completely non complete nonsense. So we have the Bible, and people keep saying the Bible, the Bible, the Bible. And I am a Christian, I use the Bible as my source to understand my culture and as a window into the knowledge of God, as a book, as text. But the text in itself is not the light. According to the text itself, the word incarnate is the light that gives us a anchor, a direction to look, to understand things of God, not all things of God, but things of God that are important for life and love and an enlightened heart and mind and soul, not just an enlightened intellect. So when I studied the Bible, I found great conflicts for most schizoid personalities for God. Dichotomies, dualisms, antagonisms built into the ideas of God, not just the ideas of humanity, but the ideas that humanity has about God himself that they call absolute. The Bible is supposed to speak of truth, and I think it does. I think so much more in the world speaks of truth too, we just can't see it. So if we say the Bible is the inspired word of God, that doesn't mean I have the inspiration to read it aright. Same with nature, same with anything. Unless the assurance is in me, unless God speaks to me directly somehow, more deeply than intellect, even if through intellect, then I cannot say there is a lot of value in the letter. In fact, there's so much argument in the epistles and the gospel even to John to suggest that on one hand, the light sometimes is deliberately locked out. If you take these synoptic gospels, you read there that Jesus spoke in parables and the idea seems to be that at times so that people would not hear when they hear and so that when they see they would not see what he was talking about. It's an amazing thing to consider that God would withhold light at times and I can see some specific reasons for that when he's dealing with religious people because perhaps in a, it's not adequate to the to the explanation, but perhaps what he's doing is taking us to the logic of our own conclusions, our own intellectual conclusions. And he's done that in the Sermon of the Mount. The problem is that while Jesus speaks in parables in order to mask his intentions for their better, for the better good, for the, for the divine purposes of the Father, so much of Christianity preaches parables and the the more subtle apparent commands of the Sermon on the Mount and so on as if they were moral mandates. The Bible is said to be the Word of God and actually it points to the Word of God. The living incarnate ascended Lord 
He dynamically instructs by his spirit, moment by moment and eternally. But you'd never know that from so much of what's preached from the New Testament and even, I mean, in the New Testament ought to be that finger pointing to the living word, Jesus himself. The word is a person. I am the way, the truth and the life is a person. Truth is a person, a dynamic thing. You know, we have to be careful about how we talk about relationship because a lot of people think they're having a relationship with God when they're having a relationship with their own dogmatics. Ignorance is an important part of the intellect. The more we confess our unknowing, the more likely we are to come into some sort of assurance. So from our perspective, it can seem like four different Gospels at least. And after the Apostolic Age, of course, we could say dozens of them. But I'm very interested in what Paul was doing. So he wasn't in, in the physical historical sense a witness to the events of Christ's life, but he becomes for some sections of the Christian church the whole gospel. But in fact, my perspective on St Paul has changed a little bit in recent years. I had to ask myself, why if Paul is the, the apostle to the Gentiles, that means to say he's a Jew himself, but why is he speaking so much about Judaism? And yet he's the apostle to the Gentiles who says people don't have to become circumcised, to be, they don't have to become Jews to become Christians. And the reason is this, that in a certain important sense, while he's presenting the gospel, is actually giving an apologetic against something, not for something. So those precious letters he wrote from, uh, to the Romans and to the Galatians and Ephesians and so on, but particularly the Romans and the Galatians about law and grace, are very much like what Jesus was saying, I came not to the Gentiles, but to the Jews. Well, certainly St Paul came for the... Was, ordained to teach the Gentiles. But so much of the justification by faith business is anti-something rather than pro. It's, it's certainly pro-grace, but it's pro-grace as an answer to law, as an answer to tradition being elevated, as an answer to anybody having to come into a ghetto to become accepted by God. So to teach... Romans and Galatians in isolation from the conflict with Judaism can distort us and our, our priorities in terms of what we're doing in this world. I love that the teachings that come out of that and they've been liberating to me, the teachings from Romans and Galatians, but why have they been liberating? And the reason they're so liberating is because I was totally Judaized as a Judeo-Christian. Guilt, the power of guilt, is what St Paul would talk about, and Hebrews in particular. Christ liberates those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong bondage in every part of their lives. And that's certainly the religious experience. Guilt, guilt, guilt. So you can be kept in the ghetto. And I'm not just talking about Judaism. I'm talking about Protestant ghettos as well. My ghettos, my childish guilt, the kind of guilt that, that makes you more of a abuser actually the power of sin is guilt and the power of guilt is the law it's an existential problem so Paul in many ways now looks like an apologist to me certainly a preacher of the gospel but a very big part of what he wrote is an apology against something and a lot of it is not for something unless you learn to translate that so the gospel what is the gospel my Jehovah's Witness friend says it's the gospel of the kingdom. A lot of my Reformed friends will say the same thing. It's not the gospel. Well, I'm not saying they wouldn't say it's not the gospel of sacrifice, but it's the gospel of a once for all sacrifice that frees us to live in this whole world, not to narrow down to the ghetto and become small-minded and then start talking to people as though our dogmatics excludes them until they accept it. 
So St. Paul, an apologetic, apologetics takes on a new light for me in recent months in particular, but years, certainly. We have to learn to preach for the beauty of what the Father in his providence has given us all. Because it's that beauty into which Christ brings us in history. It's bringing the eternal into history so that we actually live by the perspective of the eternal. But we can't do that while we keep focusing on the paradigms and the, the templates of sin, of tribal sin, Judaistic sin, and the blood sacrifices. Christ died once for all to put death, to put sacrifices out of business. All of that is done. All of that is gone. The Bible is said to be the word of God and actually it points to the word of God. The living incarnate ascended Lord who dynamically instructs by his spirit moment by moment and eternally. But you'd never know that from so much of what's preached from the New Testament and even, I mean, in the New Testament ought to be that finger pointing to the living word, Jesus himself. The word is a person. I am the way, the truth and the life is a person. Truth is a person, a dynamic thing. Now, we have to be careful about how we talk about relationship because a lot of people think they're having a relationship with God when they're having a relationship with their own dogmatics. Ignorance is an important part of the intellect. The more we confess our unknowing, the more likely we are to come into some sort of assurance. <laughs>